Okay, uh, we are starting with the next session, which is going to be chaired by Dr. Uzair Chaudhary from Ontario Institute of Agroallergist, Canada. Professor Dr. Uzair Chaudhary. Professor Dr. Uzair Chaudhary is a President, National Alliance for Safe Food Management Director, Global Halal Services. He is a founder and president of National Alliance for Safe Food Management not only in the Global Halal uh, Worker, but also a doctoral in the Dodabai Institute of Higher Education, Karachi. He has many professional affiliations, including Chief Organizer, Food Technologies Community, Karachi. Next, we are going to request uh, Dr. Mohammed Awais Khan to please co-chair the session. Dr. Mohammed Awais Khan. He's not here. Okay. Um, next, we will also request Dr. Kashipa, please, if you can co-chair the session. Dr. Kashipa Nagma. Dr. Kashmir in her MPhil and a double gold medalist holder in her PhD work from GC University. Her research interests her research interests are in fisheries and aquaculture. Thank you so much, ma'am and sir. The first presentation is going to be by Professor Dr. Uzair Chaudhary from Ontario Institute of Agrologists, Canada. He is going to be telling us something about trends in weed science research and management into 050, that is 2050. Please welcome Dr. Zair Chaudhary. Honorable guests, colleagues, inertia from academia and research institutions from Pakistan and abroad, the organizers of this uh, conference, ladies and gentlemen. The presentation has in the title, Trends in Weed Science Research and Management in 2050. So what will be the scenario? Uh, this uh, presentation is basically focused on a bit crisis caused because of the pesticides. What is the status globally? because we heard a lot of presentation this morning and there was a concern shown while we saw the presentation on cancers particularly. Let me start with uh, the concept. I knew I am going to an institution where there will be many students as well. So a um, few of my slides are very basic definitions and I will skip them quickly. What are the weeds? Weeds are basically undesired plants. They are the organisms out of place. And a newer definition in area of agronomy crop production is volunteer crops, plants emerging in subsequent crop season. So a crop plant can become a weed. So something which is precious at one time become a weed at another time. Why weed is a menace? Weed plants are also good when they are medicinal, right? We may extract some medicinal uh, valuable chemicals out of them. But they become a problem when they are out of place, when they come and compete with our crops and take away the all nutrients and water, which is a very precious commodity these days. Uh, there was this recent study published in 2018. Weed Science Society of America assigned a task to the scientists in Campbell State University, the place where I graduated my master and PhD in weed sciences. And they had a seven years average study done to review the status, how far these weeds are competing and taking away the um, capital of um, investment in the crops. Only on two crops, corn and soybean, they observed about $43 billion worth loss because of the wheat competition. Look at the situation in Ontario. The wheat crop, if you look at the graph, from 10% to maximum 53% wheat uh, infestation 
is uh, uh, resultant for the uh, yield losses. What are the weed challenges? Smaller the organisms, more the population. You must have seen and heard, elephants have fewer kids than the mice. So same is the weeds. The tremendous seed bank which they leave into a field area, that is one problem. Most weed seed dormancy breaks when crop grows. So they come in competition when the crop has a favorable weather to grow, the weeds also enjoy the same weather to grow. And they will be farm tillage advantage. When we till the soil, what we do is we unearth the soil and bring the seeds up. Seeds are getting all aviation to have their respiration gone right, up. So they have the uh, sunlight availability and they can grow faster and compete with the crop plant. Speedy growth habit wins competition for water, nutrients, light, and space. So they, I'll show you the uh, pictures in the next slides. We will see how they have win the space for the crop with the crop. They are very resilient. So they induce tolerance and resistance against biotic and abiotic stresses. So most part of my uh, presentation here will be on this resilient um, characteristic of the weed because today there is a lot of uh, resistance induced into the weeds and they have been become a havoc to control in the areas of the world where they have tremendously used um, herbicides. What is herbicide resistance? Before I jump over to herbicide resistance caused, Let's know ability of plant to grow after exposure to a lethal dose of herbicide. Globally, 350 plus weed species and biotypes have been reported developed resistance against different herbicides. Uh, this table will just um, cover few of the herbicides which are known uh, weeds have developed resistance. And this table shows the um, 2,4-D is a very common growth regulator type herbicide which uh, proliferates cell growth and um, it clogs the transportation of solutes and uh, nutrients in the plant and that is the cause of death of the plant. Phenopsy herbicides we call them, the group of her phenopsy herbicides. Uh, since 1945, look at 1963, so in the beginning there is a large gap when they discovered the resistance. Nobody knew that these plants were developing resistance. So in the beginning of the era when the herbicides were introduced, nobody was knowing and nobody uh, pointed it out. Look at the bottom part with the glyphosate, so it's also called uh, a roundup. Uh, within three years, the resistance were reported. Why? Because of the awareness, because of the information system, so knowledge uh, proliferation, so people were more aware about the health because of the uh, side effects of the herbicides. And by the way, the herbicides are the most, um, in term of um, tonnage or uh, kilograms, uh, used over the all list of uh, pesticides. So insecticides are the second after herbicides. These are the few of the weeds which are reported um, have a uh, lot of resistance to the glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate ground up um, ready crop, they say. So nowadays there are uh, crops developed by Monsanto. They have a genes in them which are resistant to the herbicide glyphosate. Glyphosate, glyphosate is a broad spectrum herbicide. It will kill all crops, plants, uh, including the weeds and crops. So they have put a gene which can resist glyphosate in the crop plant, so the crop plant is safe, but the weeds will die. So these are the few weeds which have developed resistance against glyphosate like the crop. This is a situation in uh, Ontario. Uh, one of our colleague friends, uh, Dr. Sikama, he uh, had a survey and he uh, got these uh, pictures of the weeds which have developed resistance to glyphosate. A uh, little close up with the corn, you can see how competition of the um, of weed is with the crop. They have taken away all space 
and they are also having the uh, competition for the nutrients which were provided for the crop. Look at the situation on the map of the um, uh, U.S. Uh, all these states, these are the few weeds. Um, I won't uh, spend time uh, uh, naming them all, but this gives you a scenario how the map of the North America, they have developed resistance against the uh, glyphosate roundup. <coughs> A number of resi resistant species, as I mentioned already, there are different modes of action. There are about eight modes of action uh, against which, uh, uh, the, uh, which are applied. And uh, uh, I won't go more detail on what are those enzymes and how these uh, uh, are resisted. Uh, but look at the map. Uh, it will give you an idea that about 140, uh, 160 species um, are um, uh, ALS inhibitors. And there are uh, photosynthetic inhibitors herbicide the blue line. So this is second about 100. So almost about 400 plus uh, weeds have been uh, resistant to these uh, uh, mod of actions. Um, as far as the scenario of the um, all developing countries, uh, because most herbicides are used in the U.S., Monsanto is uh, having a, a huge business in the U.S. So people have been using glyphosate uh, tremendously. So um, if you look at uh, the uh, status, how number of unique resistance has been seen in the U.S. is the highest. And uh, the second is uh, the Canada, because Canada being neighbor with U.S., we uh, try to uh, copy, uh, follow up the uh, U.S. lines. Uh, Crop-wise situation, number of herbicide resistant species, there are a lot more than wheat because wheat is a more stable uh, crop. Uh, a lo lot more areas in uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, in prairies in Canada. Uh, we have all wheat dominant area. And uh, look at the corn and soybean, 80% or 90% of the uh, crop grown in the um, U.S. is uh, glyphosate resistant and they are uh, basically corn and uh, soybean. Now, when the resistance developed, there are a lot of concerns. North America, people are educated. Media is very strong, as we have now the media coming up strong in Pakistan too. Um, and look at um, the situation in North America where the media has more uh, uh, legal framework and autonomy. Uh, about 75% um, people are now having a concern why glyphosate is here. Uh, Monsanto itself is a big giant multinational, billion dollar business. They are resisting. Uh, recently in California, uh, there was um, a sue against Monsanto and the guy who was, uh, uh, who used to spray glyphosate into the um, field area in the school. So he got uh, lymphoma cancer. Uh, so he, he, uh, he, he won the issue and um, he was probably about $300 million. So there are about 2,000 2, people more waiting to come up against uh, Roundup. If Roundup has been used in uh, North America about 35, 40 years now. When I went to study U.S. at that time, glyphosate was introduced, five years old product and it was a very potent product. So uh, it has a lot of commercial value. What are the emerging challenges in 2050? First of all, is global population. All of you are aware of uh, we are going to be 9 billion. So total world land mass is 149 um, million kilometers square. And the scientists, they say arable land is about 12 to 18 percent out of it. And about 27 uh, million kilometers is the total which is arable and at the average they say it is uh, available one acre to feed a person according to that it could be not more than 5.5 uh, billion people to be fed out of the existing resource few more challenges exacerbated climate change we did hear some presentation on climate change. Uh, the skin water resource and for irrigation, for crop to grow, you need water. And we are hearing there is no water available for drinking of the human being. And uh, you, you are all aware of the crisis uh, uh, likely Pakistan is going to confront. 
nutrients, the fertilizers, we import a lot of fertilizers from abroad. Fertilizer is very costly uh, ingredient. And there's not only one uh, fertilizer, there's uh, macro and micro nutrients which our crops need. So energy to run your tractor, to run your machinery for the farming, you need uh, investment. So that is also one challenge. Urbanization and land desertification. People are moving to the cities from the villages. And lands, they are unattended. They are getting desertification, deforestation. Environmental pollution, contamination in food chain. I'll go a little quick. Um, unpredictable health budget changes. I was watching um, in the US, the health budget has been increased from 6,000 to about 9,000 now per person every year. In Canada also, the $450 billion total federal budget goes to the health. All health is covered there. So when there will be a lot of um, pollution and uh, pest problem, uh, sorry, pesticide problems, so a lot more cases will call for health and then there will be a lot more changes in the budgetary provisions. Continuum of weed resistance against limited mode of action of the sites. This is also a challenge. Precision in current practices, we will need to have a very precise way of forming where we have to invest less on chemicals. What are the tentative solutions then? Reduce global population? How can we reduce uh, global population? It has yet not been possible. I remember when I was a student in Indian Pakistan, we were West Pakistan 4 crore and East Pakistan was 6 crore. Now West Pakistan is only 20 crore, right? So you can imagine population control is not in the very much control, social values. Increase arable land, can we do that? There is a climate change concern. It's a lot, lot more energy dependent. It's very costly, we can't do that. Of course, increase production efficiency. Still there is a room to increase production efficiency. The example of green revolution is in front of us. In 60s, I remember when we were in grade 12, grade 11 students, green revolution. <laughs>
in Pakistan. You know that Pakistan is a diverse country. So there is a rich diversity of the wild edible fruits and wild vegetables. They are used as a food as well as a nutraceutical product by the nutraceutical industry in the country. How these nutraceutical plants lead towards the industry? We have identified about 255 plant species. They have a greater potential to use as a nutraceutical product for the nutrition, for the food, for public health in Pakistan. We compare the nutraceutical uh, analysis, nutraceutical contents of these wild edible fruits and vegetables in comparison to the cultivated fruits and vegetables. There are basically three approaches. First approach is to identify the wild edible fruits and vegetables by comparing the specimens in the herbarium, in the botanical garden and in the field. Second step towards the drying and preservation of these nutraceutical products in the laboratory uh, without uh, using the chemicals is a healthy for the food. The third step is towards the nutraceutical profilings to compare the minerals, nutrients present in these wild fruits and vegetables and also present in the cultivated plants. So they, uh, this is the stage for the experimental work about the analysis of the nutraceutical products. The, second, uh, the fourth step is towards the identification of the new active antioxidant from these wild fruits and vegetables. We have published one of the study uh, recently, the potential of the wild edible fruits to combat a large number of the diseases as well as the food. So this paper is published in Journal of Health and Pharmacology from Pakistan to combat the uh, health as well as the food crisis in Pakistan. Our focal area is about the uh, number of diseases that are invaded in Pakistan, uh, the diabetes, the hepatitis, the cancers and diabetes are the among of the top diseases in Pakistan that can be, that can be treated by using these nutraceutical products present in Pakistan. Our approach is bottom-up approach. We identify the plants, then screen these plants for the bioactive compounds, then these bioactive compounds lead to what the clinical analysis and then leads to what the new drug discovery development by using a lot of analytical techniques as well as the indigenous techniques. Basic approach is from bottom-up approach. Ethnopharmacology leads to a developmental approach that is the biological and the phytochemical screening. Then these screening leads to what natural drug discovery development by using the bioactive compound from the indigenous medicinal plant from Pakistan. I think uh, I have a short of time, but I just give a glimpses. One of the drugs that we have identified, Pakistan, China, pioneer drugs, that is the patent drugs by China and Pakistan is used for the epilepsy first time introduced in this 2018. So you just see the paper published by uh, one of the prestigious journals about the potential of these drugs from Pakistan to combat the epilepsy uh, and the schedule disorders by using these pioneer drugs. Another important uh, uh, drugs that we have identified from plants are the natural dietaries. Because the people, they have obesity, so the obesity leads to number of diseases. By using the natural drugs, the obesity is reduced, then these obesity then reduce the blood, blood number of diseases like the heart and blood pressure and cancer as well. We have to uh, authenticate these herbal drugs by comparing a lot of techniques from basic identification towards the chemical profiling. Another important, the honey, honey we use every day is adapted by number of other resources. So one of my projects is about the identification of the quality of the honey by studying the melisopelenology, that is the pollen flora linked towards the honey. So these are just studies that are published in 2017 and 18 about the good products from the plants that are used towards the nutraceutical and the pharmaceutical industries. Just to see the uh, publication, recently we have published because uh, short of time, so just, I have just gave a glimpses about the potential of the nutraceutical pharmaceutical product from, from Pakistan. These are just uh, approaches from field to world by industry. Another important plant we have identified that the caprice decidua, De La Urdu Mes that is one of the important plants that is used for the bone cancer. Uh, we have identified this species and to identify some active compounds that are used for the bone therapy as well. Uh, a book published just in uh, last week 
plant and human health. We have contributed this chapter about the public health and the potential of the medicinal plant for the public health of Pakistan. Another important source is the identification of the calcium constituents in the medicinal plant. Uh, we have published a paper about the calcium producing plants from Pakistan that are used for the bone therapy and the bone uh, erythritis, rheumatism. Another paper is published by the European Journal is about the musculoskeletal disorder by using the medicinal plant. A paper published on the management of the diabetes by such type of the nutraceutical products from the plants. Uh, just published in 2018. Another important area in Pakistan is the uh, challenges for the urban markets. So a study is published from Pakistan that we imported a lot of medicinal plants from neighboring countries like Iran, India and other Afghanistan. So we have great potential for these markets. Another important plant we have identified in 2018 about the <coughs> oral disorder, that the mouth cancer. So this is another important drug from Pakistan. We have identified between Chengdu Institute of Health in China and Pakistan Kaidazim University. One of the important medicinal plants was skin cancer. So we have studied this plant between Pakistan and Chinese Academy of Science and the Chengdu Institute of Biology. A paper published on Virginia drug from Pakistan and China by CIB and QAU joint venture. These are the joint venture between Chengdu Institute of Biology China and Kaidazim University about the natural drugs used for number of cancer therapy. Another important plant, Potentilla, that is one of the plants used for the kidney dialysis, kidney cancer. So my, one of my PhD students did a work with the University of California to identify some new active bio compounds for kidney disorder by using this indigenous plant from Pakistan. These are some glimpses of my students in US. <coughs> Another important plant we have identified from Balochistan, uh, that is Feruda Okoda. My recently produced Dr. Zain did a work on, uh, the, he identified about 14 active compounds that are used for the cancer therapy on cell line experiment with the joint teacher of Mississippi University and Kaidaz University.
tin and nickel 1.5 in molar. And you can see here order of resistance, uh, the highly resistant is chromium. Uh, so you can see growth curve. Organism was grown in the presence of uh, MP medium, uh, minimal salt medium, and minimal salt medium containing chromium. Probate detected, but uh, relative activity was determined. You can see with reference to pH, which was 8, and with reference to temperature, which was 40, and uh, some metal ions were also added to see the activity of the organism. And uh, you can see here just uh, magnesium just uh, has helped to increase the activity. Otherwise, other metal ions, other metal ions did not change the activity. Uh, uh, these are some antioxidant parameters. You can see uh, glutathione acetoxidase, catalase, superoxidase mutase, peroxidase, and peroxidase. Uh, you can see uh, peroxidase has been increased uh, more profoundly as compared to the other, as compared to the control. Uh, metal processing ability was also checked, and you can see almost uh, uh, more than 60% chromium has been removed from the medium. Uh, maybe uh, this uh, removal is of two types, maybe absorption and maybe adsorption. I mean, in a combination, organism has ability to remove metals from the environment more than 90%. But here you can see the provisions of ability, uh, you can see 60, and other one is absorption is like more than 18% uh, from the environment. Uh, just to uh, just to uh, cooperate in the sense, I mean, uh, assess. You can see the uh, uh, SEM as compared to control. The shape of the organism is a little bit altered in the presence of chromium to show uh, chromium is not good for the proper growth. You can see here uh, EDX energy resolution X-ray. Uh, the aim is just to see. Uh, yeah. This one is treated, you can see, here is chromium, I don't know if you can see here or not, this one is chromium, just to, uh, just to uh, infer that organism has ability to uptake chromium. Of course, uh, when organism will update the matter inside the cell, of course, uh, the other organ, uh, enzymes will reduce the chromium 6 to chromium 3. Next is FTR, just to see the fast air, sugar, and other uh, changes. And hopefully, uh, maybe you understand this, uh, the changes here, the changes indicate these fast air, are these uh, carbohydrate uh, molecules usually uh, the membrane surface is uh, negative and all of you are familiar that the matter is that time in, in this sense uh, positive and negative I mean there are some interaction it indicates that organism is doing some work present in the environment containing metal ions I mean these changes indicate that organism is interacting with metal first metal is adsorbed and then after adsorption it will uptaken by the organism. Next you can see one of another parameter just to see uh, there are two systems one is antioxidant molecule which I have already shown may be in the form of GST and ascorbic peroxidase, peroxidase, catalase and SOD maybe there are some molecules which are known as antioxidant molecules maybe in the form of glutathione, GSH, or non-protein thiols. You can see the uh, non-protein thiol and GS uh, has been profoundly increased in the presence of matter to combat the negative effects of the chromium present in the environment. Next is, uh, this is just a proposed diagram Basis on our result, you can see chromium enter inside the. I don't know, actually, it is not working as I don't know. Uh, chromium enters inside the cell, uh, not specific uh, process, just sulfate. Uh, this, this chromate uptake here, chromium is converted into chromium, uh, different uh, valencies, basically, say 3 to 6. 
here you can see intracellular chromate reductase converted 6 into eventually into chromium 3 ROS generation here antioxidant molecule maybe one of the example is just GSH uh, GSH converted hydroperoxide which is toxic for living organism or living system but eventually converted into water and everybody knows water is life or system now life can exist without water uh, uh, to combat this oxidative stress through antioxidant molecule or antioxidant uh, enzymes here combat oxidative stress through antioxidant molecule uh, enzymes uh, we mentioned just peroxidase because it has been increased profoundly in the presence of uh, uh, metal ions mainly chromium and you can see uh, if extra chromium is available in the system of course finally it will be effluxed out uh, from the system thank you so much um, next we have a skype lecture by professor christine lee mantere sheffield university uk professor lee mantere is an internationally renowned researcher in investigating musculoskeletal novel therapies she is also a researcher in natural agent as a potential therapeutics for leukemia. She is currently the module leader for the biology of the diseases and intervertebral disc degenerations. She has 63 high index publications. Today she will be giving us a Skype lecture on treatment of leukemia with pomegranate juice. Please welcome the Skype lecture from Professor Christine. And so aside from, from the analyzed using flow cytometry and pdm iodide state, the pridium iodide is basically stains the DNA within cells, and this allows you to identify cells which are in the G0 or G1 phase, where they have one copy of the DNA, those within the synthesis phase, where the DNA is being synthesized, and therefore increasing levels of DNA will be seen, and within the mitosis or G2 phase, where you've now got double the amount of DNA. So if we look at the cell cycle results, next slide, what you can see within all of our leukemia cell lines shown by the top eight panels, we see a rest of cells within the X phase following pomegranate juice. This effect was also seen within the control cells, the CD133 cells, suggesting that we do get some arrest of cell cycle within the normal cells um, as we do within the leukemia ones, but we don't see the induction of apoptosis in those cells. Now you may be thinking, well they all this effect is just because we're putting juice in there, but it just the effects of the isotonic or osmolarity changes or pH changes. So if we do controls for this, looking at pH adjusted media and the percentage um, live cells, you can see it has very little effect on the induction of apoptosis, as opposed to the uh, pomegranate juice treatment shown in the upper right corner, where you can see high induction of apoptosis and late phase dead cells. Likewise, isotonic or osmolarity changes also have no effect on cell viability, demonstrating there's something within the pomegranate juice that is producing the bioactive component. Sorry, I said next, next slide. So we're now up to the slide which has got the cell line and the source and whether they're more affected or least affected. Hopefully you can keep up to the slides. So we demonstrated that when you look across a whole host of different cell lines, the lymphoid cell lines appear to be more sensitive to myeloid cell lines and then hematoplastic stem cells, which are our normal control cells, were the least sensitive. So we then went on to investigate which agents within the pomegranate juice could be responsible for these um, properties. So we undertook solid phase extraction to separate out the compounds within pomegranate juice according to their uh, chemical structure. Next slide. So when you put the pomegranate juice through the solid phase extraction column, there should be a little picture of a column with five tubes with different colours in the bottom now on the slide. And what you'll see when you actually do solid phase extraction, the phase which is coloured, which indicates where the polyphenols are, is the acetyl nitrile phase. And when we take these phases and treat them with cells, indeed you see the bioactive components are within the acetyl nitrile phase. The next slide is where it's task phase three results for 48 hours. And on here you can see that the only effects are observed with the acetyl nitrile phases um, where you see a good induction of apoptosis within the cell lines. So then we went on to look at the total polyphenolic compounds within the different um, agents to see which ones have the 
phenolic compound, so next slide. And as you can see, it is the acetyl nitrile phase that contains the high levels of polyphenolic compounds. Next slide. So then if we look at the acetyl nitrile fracture in more detail, with um, further analysis, so next slide, we can see with an X in 5 PI that you get blood induction of um, apoptosis and cellular death with the treatment of the um, acetyl fra nitrile fraction. Next slide. Again, we get induction of caspase 3 positivity as well, which is a marker of apoptosis. Next slide. So then we went on to do liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry to identify what the components within the different fractions were, particularly within the acetyl nitrile fraction, to identify what these potential agents could be within the pomegranate juice, which were providing these potential anti-cancer actions. Next slide. So if we look at the results from the acetyl nitrile fraction, you can see there's a number of polyphenolic compounds which have been identified, and these are computatively identified as phenocollagen, delphinidin, and cyanidin, plus a number of other agents. Next slide. So then we went on to investigate which of these um, phenolic agents could actually be the active agents which are producing the potential anti-cancerous properties. Next slide. So the pomegranate contains a whole host of different phenolic agents. So we should be up to the slide with a picture of pomegranate in the middle and then of all of the different compounds around the outside. So if we go to the next slide, what we've then done is treated cells with some of the common agents which are found in pomegranates that have been suggested by other studies to demonstrate um, bioactive compounds such as EGCG, which is actually a key component of green tea. Now what you can see with, when you treat leukemic cells with EGCG is that some of the cell lines are quite sensitive, whereas THP1s, which are a myelin cell line, show very little sensitivity. In contrast, on the next slide, when we treat with quercetin, you can see that all of the cell lines are responsive to the quercetin treatment. Next slide. But what we found is the most active agents were pudicolagia, which showed good sensitivity within three of the cell lines, less so in THP1s again. And next slide, delphinidin, which showed good um, responsive rates across all of the different cell lines. So we then went on on the next slide to investigate what um, apoptosis pathways are being activated by these agents. So I've just got some examples of results, so we've not got time to show you them all. But if you treat the cells with delphinidin, then you get induction of caspase 8. And this is in, in, indicating that we're getting extrinsic pathways of apoptosis being induced. However, on the next slide, when you look at caspase 9, you also see induction of caspase 9. So therefore, we're getting activation of both the extrinsic, suggesting binding to the death receptors, and also intrinsic pathways, suggesting activation of cytochrome C and the mitochondrial response. Next slide. So in conclusion, bioactive agents within pomegranate juice induce apoptosis and cell cycle arrest, preferentially in the leukemia cell lines, which is really important if we want to develop new therapies which are going to target the leukemia cells in um, preference to the um, normal cells within the body, which current chemotherapy agents do not do. The major bioactive components of pomegranate were found to be delphinidin and punicolagin, and they were shown to induce apoptosis both for the intrinsic and extrinsic apoptosis. And we're now looking at the molecular pathways of these actions to find out whereabouts these agents are binding and how exactly they are having the actions. So I'd just like to acknowledge, in particular, the PhD student, Hayden Duali, who was a PhD student from Saudi Arabia who did this work um, a few years ago now, and Dr. Nikki jordan Mahi, a fellow collaborator, and Gordon McDougall from the Scottish Crop Institute for the help with the mass spectrometry analysis. I'll have to take some questions um, if there's a way we can do that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. It's an honor for me to be standing here and present my work to all these educated people in front of me. Who doesn't want a healthy life? 
to look good, to feel good. We all do because it's natural. It's a human tendency to feel good. But to what extent are we ready to go for it? At what cost are we ready to look good? My topic of presentation today is perception of fat diet and weight loss tendencies among male and female young adults. I will start with a brief introduction. Uh, then I will discuss the objectives and methodology, results and end the, this presentation with a conclusion. Fat diets. <clears throat> a fat diet is a weight loss diet that becomes very popular quickly and then fails out of favor just as quickly for various reasons. Some commonly known ca uh, fat diets include controlled carbohydrates, high carbohydrate, low fat, liquid diets, diet pills, herbal diets. Now what is the link between fat diets and weight loss tendencies? As the weight loss tendencies among young adults increase, the, fat diet, the popularity of fat diets increases just as much. It starts, the cycle starts when you are motivated to lose weight. But we are so desperate to lose weight, we want it to be quick, we want a magical solution that we choose the wrong path, and we go towards fat dieting. And it does work for a while. We lose weight, we shed some fat, but then comes the plateau stage. No change, no weight loss, no weight gain. And that is followed by binge, episodes of binge eating. You eat a lot. You restrict yourself and then you start eating like a mad person. And that results in the weight gain. When you weight gain, you do not like what you see. The results are very unlike. And that makes you unsatisfied of your body again. And then the cycle continues. You are motivated to lose weight again and you choose to uh, go for fat dieting. And the cycle goes on. So the main objectives of this research were to assess the weight loss beliefs and fat diet concepts among young adults, to compare weight loss tendencies, and most importantly, check the effects of fat diets among male and female adults. The methodology followed was simple. It was a survey cross-sectional study. The, simple, uh, the process of simple random sampling was used. 80 females, 80 males were chosen from university, mostly were students. The instrument administered was self-constructed questionnaire and it was a very carefully constructed questionnaire. The data used, uh, analyzed was using uh, SPSS version 20 results. It was very interesting to know that when asked if the public was uh, aware of the term fat diet or not, 54 males and 45 females said that they were not aware, uh, aware of the term fat diets. And yet, when given the options, we observed that the most popular of the fat diet was the controlled carbohydrates, cutting down all the simple sugars and carbohydrates from the diet. Uh, on second, it was food combining, eating certain foods with the others to improve their effect. And then there was the low carb diet, uh, liquid diets, diet pills. 46% of the people said other, which probably included Atkins and uh, keto diets, which are gaining popularity every day. This is the most interesting piece of data that I found uh, personally very interesting. 61%, 33%—that uh, uh, was 61 students—had some at some point in their lives followed fat diets. What was even more interesting was when asked for how long they had uh, followed the fat diet, 37% could not follow it for more than a month, and 34% said that they couldn't uh, follow the diet for more than a week. That shows how inconsistent the fat diets are. Results of the longest diet followed. 49% uh, observed no change at all. That was because it is very difficult to carry on the fat diet. It is very difficult to restrict yourself for that long of a time period. 36% lost weight and gained it back, as we discussed before in the fat diet cycle. And only out of 100, 14% students uh, said that they lost weight and kept it off. The most common side effect of fat diet was irritability, and then we had diarrhea, vomiting, and even heart problems. Recommending a fat diet. Uh, when asked if they would recommend the fat diet to other people, 72% said no, and that was just as expected because when you follow fat diet, you know what the evils of a fat diet are. 
conclusion. In reaction to a prevailing uh, trend of cylindrics, more and more people are jumping on the wagon of fat, uh, fat diet bandwagon. The more people seem to diet, the more weight they seem to gain. That is because a recent survey of WHO says that obesity is increasing day by day, and yet the pe uh, popularity of fat diet is increasing as well. That shows that fat diets are not helping in reducing the obesity or uh, gain weight in the world. Most people today believe that to be slim, it is necessary to be healthy. To, to be slim is necessary to be healthy, and they are mistaken because most diets are so unhealthy as to be useless in the long run. When dieting to lose weight, never ever lose the sight of health and balance because that's all that you want at the end of the day. You want to be healthy and you want to be eating a balanced diet with all the essential nutrients. So uh, always consult a health professional or dietitian before considering dieting. That is because we all have different body types. Our hormone levels affect our uh, body stature. And that's why there are multiple factors that have to be considered. Don't Google the diets. Don't go for fat diets. Don't just cut your carbs or increase the proteins. Consult a professional because a diet should transform your body and not just change it in a superficial manner. You don't just want to shed the weight, you want to feel healthy. And always eat a balanced diet with plenty of variety within the calculated cal calories range. Thank you so much. Dr. Faryad Akram from Home Economics Department, Lahore College of Women University to give a presentation on studies on comparative antioxidant potential of raw and raw steak, nuts, pulses and peas. Please welcome Ms. Faryad Akram. My name is Faryad Akram and uh, my topic of presentation is uh, studies on comparative antioxidant potential of raw and roasted nuts, pulses, and seeds. When we uh, came to the diagram of nuts, pulses, and seeds, we know that nuts, pulses, and seeds represent an important part of our daily life and is important uh, in uh, and is important part of the human diet in many countries, uh, which um, represent uh, many health benefits. Um, and also uh, many epidemiological studies associated their consumption with many health benefits and often consumed after roses, roasting. That may, that may destroy some bioactive compounds, but they also reach in antioxidant potential which helps in prevention of many degenerative diseases like cancer, like um, Alzheimer's disease. Hmm, uh, research has shown that not getting enough magnesium may lead to hypertension, diabetes, heart disease and heart depression. All nuts and seeds gives a rich amount of magnesium. So by by taking these in our diet, we can prevent these all diseases. In my studies, um, I took two seeds of two seeds, two nuts and two pulses. The so two seeds were sesame seeds and the sunflower seeds. And among nuts, uh, uh, pistachio and the walnut nuts uh, were selected. Among pulses, soybean and the small lentil were selected. So, uh, in the part of the methodology in this study, I selected two nuts, pulses, and seeds. This is the comparative study. The objective of this study is to analyze the antioxidant capacity of all these nuts, pulses, and seeds, and also provide nutritional information of samples and recommend the nut, uh, nut and seed separate with their nutrition facts. So that's my part of the methodology. First, I grinded the samples and um, and also roasted the uh, all of these samples. After after grinding, extraction of all samples was done, and uh, the antioxidant total antioxidant capacity of all samples is determined by the DPPA squenching assay. So let's come to the results. Among persons examined. The pulses was uh, sesame seed, uh, sesame seed uh, sorry, pulse, uh, pulses was um, soybean and uh, small lentil. The total antioxidant capacity of pulses was soya bean had a higher antioxidant capacity than small lentil. And among uh, walnuts and pistachio, walnuts shows high antioxidant capacity than pistachio. And among seeds, sunflower seeds had a great antioxidant potential than sesame seeds. So this is the total uh, comparison of all raw and roasted nuts, pulses and seeds. Roasting time was a of 30 minutes. 
Uh, you can see that water. You can see that the black one is the wallet, which has a high antioxidant capacity and the grey one is the roasted wallet. You can see that after roasting uh, 30 minutes time, the roasted wallet decreases total antioxidant capacity. The fourth one is the pistachio. The total antioxidant capacity of pistachio is also higher than roasted pistachio. The blue one is the is the third class seeds and is also higher than total uh, roasted antioxidant capacity. So same as the, the sesame seeds and roasted sesame seeds, the roasted sesame seeds show no amount of total antioxidant capacity than uh, raw, uh, raw sesame seeds. The green one is the soya bean. Soya bean show high capacity of antioxidant capacity and the light green was the roasted Soya bean, which shows a decrease in the amount of total antioxidant capacity. The last one is the small lentil. Small lentil also shows uh, highest on total antioxidant capacity as compared to the roasted small lentil. So uh, we can conclude that the raw things which we consume in our daily life um, are rich in total antioxidant capacity than, than the roasted uh, pulses, nuts and seeds. These are all the nutritional information of nuts, seed, pulses and seeds which I have used in this study. Walnuts, pistachio, all amount of calories, fats, proteins, fibers are mentioned in, in that table. <coughs> so the next one is recommendation. I highly recommend that recipe. So I can, um, uh, that is very useful in our daily lives. So we should use in our daily life. That is one cup of walnut halves, half cup of sunflower kernels, half cup of sesame seed, one teaspoon honey, one te uh, teaspoon water. All these combines, combined in a food processor, stored spread in a refrigerator, approximately one by three cups, only serving with one table level spoons. So this is the nutrition facts of uh, my uh, spread. And at last, nut pulses and seed is the source of substances of high biological and nutritional value. There is a need to promote the use of locally available sources of antioxidants because it has a great advantage of include weight gain control, cardiovascular disease, prevention, aging control, aging protection, hypertension control, smoothing of the skin and Alzheimer's disease and cancer inhibition. And also contain minerals to encourage beneficial cooking practices through nutrition, communication, education programs in the community. Thank you. Uh, there were about uh, seven presentations, including myself. Um, we started from the um, presentation on uh, medicinal plants, uh, natural plants, um, which is uh, material which are uh, good for the health. Uh, in terms of medicine and natural uh, uh, sources. Uh, then uh, uh, I was very happy to see the uh, young professor had a uh, lot of contribution. Uh, I was proud particularly when I heard that he happened to be student of Mr. Uh, Dr. Mir Rajib. Mir Rajib was one semester junior to me when I started my uh, MS in Kailyal University. Uh, so I feel very good. Uh, second um, presentation was on role of fisheries. Um, uh, it's uh, important in um, food production, uh, food security, and um, its value as a vitamin uh, supply. Um, uh, Ms. Kashifa Nagma, the, uh, she had a nice presentation. Then there was a third presentation on multiple uh, uh, metal resistance in chromium, a reduction from untreated tannery. Uh, there was an uh, online uh, international uh, speaker. Uh, it was probably on pomegranate uh, treatment of leukemia. A lot of uh, pomegranate is uh, sold in uh, Canadian uh, grocery store, and that encouraged me. I will prefer buying. Uh, uh, from the night, uh, also a uh, source uh, for help against cancer. Uh, presentation um, fat diet uh, was presented here. 
dietitians uh, sit in Canada with the health practitioners and they are paid by the uh, government or him. So dietitians, I don't know how much scope they have in Pakistan, but in North America, dietitians are sitting beside the uh, uh, family medicine practitioners. Present the shield of honor to our chair and co-chair and our two guest speakers. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kashka Nakma. also like to ask uh, Professor Jay Perkins to please have your shield of honor. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Professor Dr. Mushtaq Ahmed. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. <laughs> 